right, we are recording. Okay. Hey, everyone. Uh, thank you all for coming um, to our to our presentation, Concussion, Fixing the Problem. I am uh, Dr. Joseph Coppice, the owner of Delta Neural Health. Uh, I am a doctor of chiropractic. I have a certification in functional medicine, and I have a diplomate in the American Chiropractic Neurology Board. Uh, I am also a husband. I am an expectant father. Uh, let's see. <laughs> uh, I am a former patient, so I've sustained a concussion and had uh, the negative effects of that. Uh, you know, I experienced uh, pretty bad headaches and then POTS-like symptoms uh, for a few years after my concussion. And then luckily I was able to find a functional neurologist in functional neurology and uh, I was able to find relief by uh, going through with that care. Uh, so like I mentioned, I am a functional neurology and a functional medicine practitioner, the owner here at Delta Neural Health. I'm the host of the Neural Health Podcast and the previous Neural Wellness Podcast uh, and a brain health advocate. Oh, there I am. <laughs> a, little bit of, well, a little about our clinic. Uh, our clinic serves the uh, following uh, services, or we provide the following services, I should say. Uh, we provide functional neurology, functional medicine, neurofeedback care, chiropractic care, as well as clinical nutrition. So uh, the providers here are myself, and there's Dr. Jill Wagner. I mostly head the functional neurology care, and Dr. Jill uh, heads the functional medicine care. So the reason you're all here uh, is because of the topic, concussion, right? And uh, and some of you may be here because of post-concussion syndrome. So we're going to get into uh, kind of what concussion is and then how it leads into post-concussion syndrome. And then how do we actually fix the problem? Uh, so that's our goal for tonight. So what is concussion? Concussion is a type of traumatic brain injury or a TBI, you may be familiar with it. Uh, it's defined as a brain injury caused by a blow to the head or a violent shaking of the head and body. This can occur with or without the loss of consciousness. Um, and although uh, described as a mild traumatic brain injury, concussion is often described as a mild traumatic brain injury. The impact on someone suffering with a mild traumatic brain injury is often anything but mild. Uh, concussions, mild traumatic brain injury can be completely disruptive to life, making it hard to go to school, participate in your activities, go to work, engage with family, engage with friends, go out to restaurants, concerts, just all the things that uh, provide zest in life and you know, all these great things about life can be so dramatically uh, hindered by concussion. And I think a, a really troublesome thing about concussion that many of my patients often complain of and make mention of is it's really hard to explain to other people what is going on, right? Concussion is essentially a quote unquote invisible injury. Typically doesn't show up on MRI, typically doesn't show up on x-ray or CT scans. So, you know, doesn't show up on lab work typically. So if there's nothing in conventional medicine that is showing us that there is a concussion, in fact, a concussion, how are we supposed to convey that information to our loved ones so they can better understand what we're going through? And hopefully if I'm successful tonight, I'll be able to... Uh, uh, explain some of the ways that we can actually do that. Okay, so here's a quick little video just demonstrating uh, what's going on in the brain with concussion. So I'm going to hit play here. Okay, so we can see this person, they're hitting the front of their head. So that's a coup injury. And then they have this uh, dramatic whiplash uh, counter coup injury. So you can see both sites of impact to the front of the brain and the back of the brain. 
So the brain is, it's pretty squishy inside the skull, right? So it's, it's going to be moving, it's going to be shifting. So, you know, even though you may have hit your head, maybe on the right side of your head, it doesn't mean that that's necessarily going to be where all of your problems are coming from, right? Because we have this coup counter coup injury, uh, there are multiple areas of the brain that can be affected. Not only that, but there's also torsional activity. So imagine that your brain is a wet towel, right? So if I take a wet towel, I'm gonna grab the top part of the towel and the bottom part of the towel. And let's say I ring, ring out the towel. The, the points of contact, the points of twisting are gonna be above and below, right? However, where does the majority of the torsion or the strain happen? Typically it happens in the middle, right? So you can imagine your head is the top part of the towel and maybe your neck or your body or the bottom part of the towel. So what's there in the middle? The brainstem. A lot of times in concussion, we see issues of torsion uh, in the brainstem. You know, these, these neurons that run through the brainstem from the cortex down to the spinal cord, they, they twist, they, there's torsion, there's pulling, there's tearing, there's injury of those neurons. However, these things don't typically show up in imaging. There's going to be a very important distinction that we want to talk about between anatomical lesions and physiological lesions, right? Structural versus functional lesions, okay? So since I'm on that point, why don't I just uh, explain a little further? But uh, a functional, or sorry, a, an anatomical or a structural lesion these are things that you're going to see on MRI. These are things you're going to see on CT, right? Think tumor, stroke, things that stand out. But then you also have physiological lesions or, or uh, functional lesions. These don't. These we need to actually do further testing for and actually put these networks and regions to the test. But more on that later. Um, if you've had a concussion, uh, one, if not all, if not most of these symptoms are going to stand out to you. So I'm just going to list them off for you. Because the brain controls everything, you got to imagine uh, so many aspects of livelihood of symptomatology can be affected. So we can have headaches, suppression, neck pain, nausea or vomiting, dizziness, blurred vision, balance problems, light or sound sensitivity. We can have brain fog, concentration issues, memory problems, fatigue, confusion, drowsiness, trouble falling asleep, more emotional, irritable, sadness, nervousness, sleeping more, maybe sleeping less than usual, difficulty sleeping soundly, ringing in the ears, numbness or tingling, feeling slowed down, or just overall don't feel right. So this is a lot of things to consider. And if you are going through a symptom-based model of healthcare, this is going to be a lot for anybody to manage, right? So you cannot just pick apart these symptoms and then medicate or treat based on these symptoms. There are We have to have an understanding of why these symptoms are there in the first place. And it all goes back to that brain injury and those regions, those networks, those connections of the brain that were injured. So many of you may or may not be familiar with the different subtypes of concussion. So uh, I'm gonna kind of list them out for you and kind of break it down. Uh, so you can see there's cognitive, there's vestibular, there's post-traumatic, there's anxiety, and then there's oculomotor. And each of these subtypes have certain symptoms that are uh, related to them. So first we have the cognitive subtype. So symptoms that might be um, uh, might be present if you have the cognitive subtype of concussion would be attention issues, impaired reaction time, problems with memory, brain fog, fatigue. Someone may have the vestibular subtype where their symptoms are primarily dizziness, fogginess, lightheadedness, imbalance, nausea. Or maybe you have the oculomotor subtype 
or you have focus problems, eye strain, pain, or even pressure behind your eyes, blurred or double vision, light or screen sensitivity, difficulty with reading or focusing, difficulty with depth perception. I would also say uh, motion sensitivity too is a big one with the uh, oculomotor subtype. We could also have the anxiety or the mood subtype where we're, our predominant symptoms are nervousness, irritability, sadness, feelings of overwhelm, emotionality, or an unstable mood. You know, many people with concussion will note behavioral changes. Uh, and then, of course, there's the migraine subtype. So somebody with the migraine subtype may have uh, predominantly stronger headaches or nausea, the light sound or smell sensitivities. Maybe they'll get an aura. Maybe they'll have that neck stiffness as well. And then additionally, outside of just those mentioned and established subtypes, we can have autonomic dysfunction like myself. You can have neck pain and instability. It's nearly, it's pretty much impossible to have a concussion without subsequent whiplash injury. So oftentimes when we're addressing concussion, we also have to address the neck and cervical integrity. Uh, and then also sleep disturbances. Like I mentioned earlier, you could either be sleeping more than usual, less than usual, trouble falling asleep, trouble staying asleep. There's, there's so many uh, different and complex symptoms that can go hand in hand with concussion. So maybe I just listed those off and you're like, wait a minute, Dr. Joe, I have a lot of symptoms in the migraine category. I have a lot of symptoms in the cognitive category. I have a lot of symptoms in the vestibular category. So which, which box do I fit in? Well, the thing is, uh, I don't think I've ever met a concussion patient that's fit into one box, right? Usually it's more of a Venn diagram like we have pictured here. So maybe yours is predominantly vestibular, but then you also have some oculomotor issues and some, uh, some anxiety as well wrapped up into that. Uh, maybe it's more cognitive and uh, ocular motor, you know, whatever it might be. Maybe it's all of them. That is not that uncommon to have, you know, all of the subtypes of concussion, uh, especially those who make their way into our office. Uh, so this is just a kind of a typical projected concussion management timeline, right? Of course, this is not always so clean cut and linear, but let's just go over it. So initially you have the injury. The injury needs to be diagnosed first. Is it a mild TBI or is it a TBI? Do we need to get you to a CT scan ASAP or do we need to wait and monitor? Uh, and then we start with acute interventions, whatever those might be, whatever may be appropriate for you and your condition. Uh, we need to address comorbidities like the cervical whiplash we mentioned, uh, identify persistent dysfunction and establish a pre-treatment baseline. Okay, so what does that mean? We need to know how you are testing on our baseline uh, diagnostic intake uh, assessments. Uh, then you might start subacute care, such as aerobic exercise. Um, you may then address sensory motor or other underlying dysfunction of the nervous system. That's kind of where we really shine. Uh, and then should be, we be successful, we can start to return to daily life and normal activities, however you define that. And then we want to establish a new baseline. So if you were to uh, sustain a, a future concussion, we now have that kind of up-to-date baseline data that we can refer back to um, after the fact. Uh, for those here who are interested in uh, return to play or, um, uh, yeah, those who are uh, involved in high school, college, uh, pro sports, this is kind of the CDC's step-by-step -step guide to return to competitive activity. You know, many people with post-concussion syndrome, that's the last thing they're really worried about, but let's go over it regardless. Um, so first, we need to go back to regular daily activities without the provocation of symptoms. And then we can go on to light aerobic activity 
Uh, so this could be like a light jog, walking, the exercise bike, these sorts of low impact, easy, low intensity exercises. So long as that goes well and we're not becoming symptomatic um, or worsening of our condition, we can move on then to moderate activity. This could be then increasing our intensity with the jogging. We can start to introduce uh, resistance training or weightlifting, uh, biking, et cetera. So long as that's good, we can move on to step four. This is heavy or non-contact activities. This is where we start to do a little bit more uh, sport-specific exercises. So maybe you're in soccer and you can do more cutting or sprinting. So that high-intensity jog or bike riding, uh, regular intensity lifting, and then non-contact drills. So those sport-specific drills, uh, like speed, endurance, uh, agility training, that sort of thing. Uh, from there, we can move on to practice and full contact within kind of a controlled setting that is a practice, right? You've got coaches, you've got your teammates who are looking out for you. Um, they know the situation, so everything's a little bit more monitored, so we can kind of get into that phase next. And then lastly, so long as we can handle practice and full contact uh, practice, we can then return to competition. Um, I do just want to take a little uh, minute to address a very common question that I get in the office, and that is, um, you know, should I continue to play or should my child continue to play? And to that, I would say it always depends, right? So if you come in and you your child is on their third, fourth, fifth, eighth concussion, and, you know, they're in ninth grade and you know they really want to play but you know chances are they're not going to the nhl or the nfl um they just really love to play you know i would ask and um kind of challenge uh the parent and the child to consider you know what what are the long-term pros and cons of playing the sport right uh, first, are there any alternatives that we can consider? Uh, you know, there's a ton of uh, sports, physical activity that we can participate in that are less likely to result in concussion. You know, concussion can happen from anything, right? Uh, I got mine just from uh, bringing my head up from underneath the table. So concussion can happen no matter what we're doing. But there are definitely sports that are... Uh, that have a higher likelihood than others. So I would ask, if it were my child, I would ask, what is your long-term goal? Is your long-term goal to be a football player? Then maybe, but I mean, that's such a low percentage. More likely than not, your child's going to want to go to college. They're going to want to get kind of a stable job, making money where they really need the use of their brain, their cognitive function, things like that. So I say, is it worth potentially sacrificing your future success in, say, academics or your career field of choice just to play high school football? You know, it very well could be. And many people do just fine playing football, playing hockey. But um, that's just something that I often get asked. And I would just implore you to really... Uh, consider all the pros and cons of the long-term uh, effects of concussion. So when it comes to concussion, though, 80% uh, of concussion recover in 7 to 21 days. In some cases, it may take six months or longer to recover. And this is where we start to get into uh, the post-concussion syndrome, right? These are the patients that come to see us. Those that didn't resolve on their own, didn't resolve by kind of uh, other standard means of uh, interventions. So what happens if you don't recover on your own? And that's where we're really going to get into the meat of our uh, discussion today. So uh, here we've got a man in space uh, to illustrate that the brain is the most complex system in our known universe, right? 
we're still learning so much about the brain. There's so much we don't know about it. And this, because it's so complex, our approach to treating the brain, to rec rehabbing the brain, needs to be equally as complex and in depth, right? We try to make it simple and understandable, but really there's a lot that has to go into our rehab process and our evaluative our evaluation process. Um, so what is the uh, evaluation that we perform? How do we assess mild traumatic brain injury, concussion, uh, other brain injury? So the goal of a functional neurological evalu wow. <laughs> the goal of a functional functional neurology evaluation is to get to the root of the dysfunction in the nervous system. Uh, the testing needs to be thorough and encompass all of the potential dysfunctions that we often see in concussion. So I mentioned cognitive, I mentioned vestibular, I mentioned oculomotor, I mentioned uh, mood, anxiety, um, I mentioned migraine, I mentioned headache, I mentioned autonomics, I mentioned cervical, I mentioned sleep. All of these things need to go into our evaluation. So if you're not, if you haven't had an evaluation that has encompassed all those things and you're still struggling, chances are someone's missing something, right? So here are the four elements of our post-concussion evaluation of our functional neurology evaluation. So it all begins with our diagnostic testing. So this is this includes computerized, standardized cognitive testing, uh, video oculography or video nystagmography, the OG, VNG, basically that's uh, eye tracking software, which we'll show you here in a little bit. Uh, we also look at posturography, AKA balance. It's a little more complex than just balance because we're putting you through a variety of different uh, scenarios to really test and tease out your balance and which parts of balance are uh, dysfunctional. Uh, the next step is an unhurried history. And I emphasize the word, word unhurried. So many patients that come our way say that they've maybe max gotten five minutes with their practitioner. And we've kind of already established how complex the brain is, how complex concussion is. Five minutes is not going to cut it. It's just not. So we really need to know what's going on, how you are suffering, and what your specific goals are. You know, your goals, you may, all you may want to do is get back to uh, working your uh, your job as a lawyer, maybe you really just want to finish class, like that might be your goal, or maybe your goal is to uh, get back on the ice or get back on the field and compete at a professional level. Either way, we need to take your specific goals and where you're at into consideration uh, and not rush through that. That's very important. Uh, next, we uh, perform a comprehensive bedside neurological battery of testing both of your neuroanatomy and neurophysiology, okay? So this is the cornerstone, this is the bedrock of any good functional neurology exam uh, to assess concussion. This is where we really get into the nitty gritty of what's going on in your nervous system, how it's functioning. Finally, we give you our report of findings. We go over everything we saw that day. We show you what's good. We show you what's not so good. We validate what you've been feeling. I think so many patients are just relieved by the exam because like I said, you don't see it on MRI, you don't see it on CT, you don't see it in the blood work all the time. But what we're able to provide is show, we're able to show you there are functional deficits outside of a normative data range that coincide with your symptoms. Hey, your eyes are not working well. That's why you can't track anything. That's why you're getting motion sickness. That's why you're getting headaches. That's why you're getting neck pain. That's why you're getting dizziness and vertigo. Like we, we can show all these things on our exam and that is profoundly impactful for patients. And then they can take that information and say, hey, family member, I told you so. And nicer words, right? 
but they can show their family members and say, hey, like, this is what I've been trying to tell you. It's been, and that, that that's the tough thing about concussion too, because we have cognitive impairments typically. We have a hard time expressing what we're feeling, right? So not only are you suffering, you're struggling, but you're having a hard time expressing how you're suffering. So I think what the what our exam really does a good job of is a it validates what you're feeling, and it b and b it allows you to more easily explain and uh, present what's going on in your brain. Uh, and then part of that report of finding, uh, we go over an action plan. So we talk about what we need to do going forward. Does that include uh, a neuro rehab program? Does that include supplementary interventions? Does that include uh, dietary changes, certain aerobic or uh, other exercise programs we need to incorporate? So we take all of these things into, consider into consideration in order to get you to where you need to go. Uh, okay. So uh, the first thing we mentioned were our diagnostic tests, right? So the first thing, one of the first things we do is a uh, baseline cognitive assessment, right? Uh, so this is the C3 logics. It was developed by the um, Cleveland Clinic. It's a really good pre and post concussion assessment tool. We use this on all of our patients because it is such a solid uh, cognitive assessment, but this is especially uh, valid for post-concussion patients. So unfortunately, oftentimes for us, uh, by the time people get to us, they've already been suffering with their concussion for uh, quite some time. Uh, so we don't often get pre-concussion data. We're trying to change that. We're trying to get involved in more schools and athletic programs so we can have this data prior to the concussion ever happening so that we know where that athlete's baseline is or where that person's baseline is. But, you know, there's only so much we can do. Uh, but what we do have here is uh, down in the blue, you'll see this is how uh, kind of a non-concussed person may perform in the 50th percentile, right? Somebody who's relatively asymptomatic. So you can see that person or the average would be about a two symptom severity. Uh, their standard assessment of cognition or that SAC might be a 26. Uh, their trails testing might be a 24, trails B, so on and so forth. I'll let you read that. Um, and then what we can do then is you can see that we have our initial testing from our patient on our, on our evaluation. So this person had a symptom severity of 107, right? That's a far cry from two, right? So they were definitely struggling. Um, we could see how they're performing cognitively. That's the SAC, Standard Assessment of Cognition. So we're looking at verbal memory, immediate and delayed. We're looking at um, concentration, orientation, things of that nature. So we can see how they might compare to uh, their peers. Uh, there's only one little caveat here. We, we um, have our patients memorize or repeat back 10 words when they were collecting this data, they only had them memorize or repeat back five words. So our patients generally have higher opportunity for points, but ours is generally tougher. So we just try to keep it relative based on um, the way we've kind of changed our testing. Uh, then we look at trails A, and I'll show you an example of that, uh, so on and so forth. I'll show you examples of uh, these cognitive testings here in a second. But uh, he here's an example of our symptom severity. So the first one on the left of the screen under the word testing, uh, this is when this person first came in. So you can see uh, just about every symptom that we listed on that concussion, uh, on those concussion uh, symptom list, they marked all of them except two. And they were either moderate, severe, uh, and a couple mild intensities. After working with this person for just a couple weeks, we were actually able to shift their symptoms to what you see there on the right under the logics uh, word. So almost all zeros or milds, no moderates, no severes. So this person is doing great and we're gonna keep working with them, keep working with them to do their at-home exercises, to keep moving those symptoms in the right direction. 
Uh, here's what some of the testing might look like. So this was the trails testing I mentioned. So um, so this is where uh, the patient would have to try to follow the line, connect the dots, one, two, three, four, uh, so on and so forth as fast as they can. And then they're compared against uh, their peers. Then it gets a little more complicated. This is called trails B on the right. This is where we're going 1A, 2B, 3C. Uh, as fast as you can. This really starts to uh, get more cognitively demanding uh, for the participant. Uh, then we look at processing speed. So we might have the patient uh, try to uh, match the symbols with the key above as fast as they can. They have two minutes and they're trying to get as many of these codes broken as possible, right? And again, we compare their performance to kind of the 50th percentile for their demographic. Then we look at reaction time. Reaction time is often affected in concussion. So we have this testing. Uh, I'll just play this again. But what uh, what's going on here is you're holding uh, that blue button, and then you're waiting for that green dot to appear. As soon as it appears, you want to tap it as fast as you can. And the the computer is measuring how fast you're able to respond to when that dot appears to when you can hit it. So we have standards of what we should see and then uh, then standard deviations away from that. And then we look at choice reaction time. So you're holding both boxes and then you're trying to hit just the green, not the blue. This is a good measure of choice reaction time, uh, response inhibition, um, uh, things of that nature. A little bit of processing speed as well. Go, no go, right versus wrong, uh, things like that. And then I mentioned video oculography. So this is just one example of uh, one of the eye tracking tests that we might run. We're going to do a whole battery of eye tracking tests, which is going to give us a lot of good information about brain function and brain dysfunction. You may have heard that the eyes are the window to the soul. Well, we also believe that the eyes are the window to the brain. So if we can see how well the eyes are or are not performing, then we can have a pretty good idea of which regions, which connections, which networks of the brain were injured by concussion. So in the example here, you'll see that uh, this person, they were trying to follow this blue line, right? The dot was moving left and right in a smooth pattern. Uh, these uh, lines, the red and the green, that's what their eyes were actually doing. It should be overlapping. They should be one-to-one. -one. So this person really struggled with following. You can imagine that they're going to have a hard time focusing. They're probably going to have headaches. They're probably going to have some motion sickness, so on and so forth. And then after we worked with them for a couple weeks, this is what their eyes look like. So you can see how much smoother those eyes are, right? They're following that target. Uh, so this is the power of the care we provide here. Um, and you can just imagine how much easier that person is going to be able to integrate information into their life. Things aren't going to be so uh, stimulating, so difficult. They're going to be able to engage in the world much better, much easier. Okay. Uh, and lastly, we look at posturography or balance. Uh, I put up just kind of our standard test here. So we're looking at how do you perform eyes open? How do you perform eyes closed on a flat surface? How do you perform eyes open, eyes closed on a foam surface? You know, are you within a healthy range? Are you a standard deviation or two outside of the healthy range? Are you a fall risk given that uh, specific position? Uh, and then what I didn't include also is um, we also look at head position. How does head position change things? going back to vestibular function and cervical function, right? Or dysfunction, rather. Uh, so does putting your head to the right totally throw off your balance? Does putting your head up totally throw off your balance? We're also going to look at how do mental tasks throw off your balance? How does using your frontal lobe throw off your balance? And all this information is just going to be so helpful for us as we paint a deeper picture of the, the areas of the brain that were affected by concussion and are still present. Uh, then we move on to our bedside neurological testing. So within that, we cover in-depth autonomic testing. We do cranial nerve testing. 
We do sensory testing. We do motor testing. We check your reflexes. We check your muscle strength. We check your eye movements again. We check your vestibular function. All of these things. And we are folk, we are worried about anatomical and structural changes, right? That is something we are definitely concerned with. But most patients that find their way to us, they've already had that stuff checked out. So what we really find and what we can really offer to patients are uh, is information on the functional changes of the brain post-concussion, right? So what are the little nuances? What are the shades of gray that aren't doing well that might not show up kind of in a, a maybe a five-minute standard medical neurological exam, right? So we really try to nail down your brain and your brain injury. So we have to approach this like Sherlock Holmes, right? So we, we take all the testing, all the knowledge, all the information that we gain from the testing, and we create clues. We, we develop clues. We develop a hypothesis about, you know, okay, this test was uh, maybe a little dysfunctional. And then maybe this test was a little dysfunctional, but this test was good, but they performed this test in maybe a suboptimal way. The more data points we're able to accumulate, the better the picture, the more clear the picture we're going to have on your specific brain injury, right? And then once we're able to identify the issue, you know, we're not just throwing darts in the dark, you know, we're able to then create a specific treatment plan to then rehabilitate and target those connections and networks of the brain to improve their function and reduce the symptoms that are associated with that dysfunction. So our individualized treatment plan, that's where it's gotta start, right? No brain injury is ever the same, therefore no treatment plan should ever be the same, right? There are no cookie cutter approaches in concussion rehab. There's no protocol. It's all based on you, what, what we found on the testing, what your goals are, what your symptoms are, and then of course, what can you actually handle, right? Because we may come up with a great strategy going forward, but you just may not be able to handle XYZ therapy. That's why we have to be uh, dynamic and adaptive and change our therapies based on what you're able to handle because we don't want to push you past your limits. We want to find your limits and then increase your limits, right? Uh, hopefully that analogy made sense. <laughs> but uh, of course, the individual treatment plan or the treatment plan has to be individualized. Uh, it's non-invasive. It's therapeutic in nature, meaning our goal is to rehab, not just to give you a crutch or give you a Band-Aid. It's research-based. We are outcomes-driven. Uh, and along with that is objectively monitored. So we're always checking your objective findings from the exam to make sure that we're actually seeing the changes that we're intending to. I mentioned it being dynamic and adaptive. So let's say you do great and I have my treatment plan figured out and you just excel, you do so well and you've outgrown your treatment plan. So now I need to adapt it to where you've grown to and make it harder, make it more challenging, incorporate more aspects of your neurology into this so that we can better reintegrate you back into the, the goals that you want to achieve. Um, and on the flip side, let's say you just can't handle something. Then we have to adjust to make it easier or to make it more stepwise, you know, really build up your foundation, bef crawl before we can walk, before we can run. You know, everybody's going to be, uh, everybody's going to, um, develop differently. Everyone's going to respond differently. And then, of course, they are brain-based, right? Brain is a sensory motor organ. So if we can evaluate it, the sensory and the motor output and input, then we can use that data and we can use that mindset to actually create sensory motor input and output and make positive changes in the brain. Uh, okay. So key concept going piggybacking off of uh, that uh, is the concept of neuroplasticity. 
So I don't know if any of you are familiar with that term, but basically it is the process that involves adaptive and structural and functional changes to the brain. Uh, I define it simply as the brain has the ability to adapt and change given the appropriate stimuli and environment, right? And that could be for the positive or the negative, right? You're gonna have neuroplastic changes for the negative after concussion. What we wanna aim to do is give you positive neuroplastic changes uh, to rehab those negative things. Um, yeah, so I often give the example of learning how to play the piano. I may not know how to play the piano today, but tomorrow I can sit down with a piano instructor for say an hour. They can teach me how to play piano. They can teach me my chords, my arpeggios or whatever. Um, and chances are by the end of that hour, I'm gonna know a lot more about the piano than I did today. However, if I don't touch the piano for another month, chances are I'm gonna forget everything I learned, right? So there was neuroplasticity plasticity initially, but then I did not create those long-term changes. So what should I do instead? I should take that hour session and then every day for the next month, I should practice for five minutes. And what's gonna happen if I practice for five minutes a day? Chances are I'm gonna retain what I learned during that hour and I'm possibly even gonna learn more than what I was initially taught during that first lesson. Uh, so then my next lesson, I'm just gonna be rolling with it. I'm, we're just gonna go even further and further and further, but I need to put in the work to not only make the changes, but to cement the changes. Um, one other, so something else I want to talk about with concussion, uh, is the concept of compensating. So, uh, a lot of people, especially after their, maybe their first, maybe their second concussion may have compensations or their brains may compensate for the dysfunction, right? So our brains are smart. They figure out how to work around something. That doesn't mean it's going to be the most efficient and effective uh, way of doing things, but they're going to figure it out. I often use the example of, uh, let's say you've got somebody in the Middle Ages who uh, had a shoulder injury. Physical therapists didn't really exist in the Middle Ages. So what might happen to that person with a shoulder injury? You know, it might hurt them to move, so they might start avoiding the movement right? So they may not use that shoulder anymore. They might just use the elbow. They might use the fingers. They might over rely on the other shoulder to do things. And then what's going to happen over time is those shoulder muscles are going to atrophy. We're going to develop adhesions. Our shoulder is going to lose range of motion. It's going to become less and less effective the less and less we use it. And that's where that negative plasticity kind of comes in. So yes, we figured out a way around it where we can function in life, but it's probably not the most optimal way of doing things. So oftentimes people ask me, what do treatments actually look like in our office? Uh, so we got a great video here of my wife. Oh, uh, so, so here's one example. This is called an interactive metronome. We've got a Dynavision, a D2, working on a hand-eye coordination. Um, you know, we're doing some reaction ball uh, testing there, balance training. You know, here's just an example of something you could do outside and balance things. So we just shot this video uh, back in October. So I figured this was kind of appropriate. Um, so that's just a couple of things that we might be doing. Um, you know, here's one of our treatments, uh, common treatments for POTS or dysautonomia. So we, we do a combination of electrical stimulation. We do vestibular uh, therapies. We do ocular motor therapies. We do eye movement therapies. We do cognitive games and therapies. Uh, we do different body works, physical activities. It's all going to, it's all, it's got to be creative at the end of the day and it's got to be patient specific. So a lot of these tools are great, but at the end of the day, uh, the greatest tool that we as functional neurologists have is our brains and our creativity. Um, and how we meet the patient where they're at. 
Uh, here's an example of maybe some cognitive uh, therapies we might do. This is an app called Brain HQ. So uh, this person needs to kind of follow the, the sequence of the numbers in order as it's moving. Uh, so this is a pretty cool app because it kind of tailors itself to you and uh, your particular um, abilities. Uh, here's one where somebody has to have a good spatial memory, you know, remember which keys uh, were there and then where was the new key added. So yeah, just one little example that I thought I'd add into the to the lecture here. Uh, so ultimately, our goal here at Delta Neuro Health is to first and foremost identify the underlying neurological dysfunction that's causing your particular symptoms. Then we want to create a customized and therapeutic treatment plan to fix the found problems. And then we want to accomplish lasting neurophysiological changes to reach your unique goals of recovery. Okay. So I can't harp on that enough that this is so patient specific, it's very thorough, and it's very individualized and focused on you and your recovery. Uh, and ultimately, it is a collaborative effort. So I love this picture because it just so perfectly illustrates our role as healthcare providers uh, in the management of post-concussion. So you're here on the left, um, you're trying to get over this chasm, you can't do it on your own. You just need a little bit of help and we're there down there in the trenches holding up that bridge so that you can cross over and then continue your journey, right? This isn't meant to be a long-term thing, you being here. This is just supposed to get you over that chasm so that you can continue your life journey and enjoy it to the best of your ability. And along with that, you see, I'm not the only one down there. While I would argue that functional neurology is probably the best, uh, best type of practice to address all the different uh, facets of concussion, you know, we do co-manage with other practitioners, you know, other chiropractors, other healthcare providers, mental health providers, medical doctors, medical neurologists as needed. It is a team effort um, and we treat it as such. So if uh, you're interested in hearing more, uh, feel free to follow Delta Neuro Health. We are on Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, TikTok uh, is where we do a lot of our posting. We do have a podcast, a current podcast called the Neural Health Broadcast that is streamed on Spotify, YouTube, and Apple. So we've got a lot of great information on concussion there already. Uh, and then if you're interested or if you know anyone interested, our next event is going to be May 15th, which is a Wednesday uh, at 7 p.m. here at Delta Neural Health as we are talking childhood neurodevelopmental delays. Uh, so really excited about that one. So if you uh, know of anybody who might benefit from that, please uh, share this information with them. Uh, and again, thank you for taking time out of your Thursday night to listen to me ramble for just about an hour. Uh, hopefully this was informative. Hopefully you got a lot out of this. Um, you know, if you have any specific questions, for me, uh, there's my email. That's my direct email. Feel free to give me a shout. Uh, if you want to call us to schedule a consultation to talk more specifically about uh, your concussion or maybe something else that you might be experiencing or dealing with, uh, feel free to give us a call and we'll get that set up for you. All right. So I'm going to pause the recording and take some questions.